Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Kenny Vaughn. He's going to share some stories about the Rolling Stones. It was either late 65 or early 66 they played at the Auditorium Arena in Denver. Often credited uh, wrong venue in different publications, including Bill Wyman's book. But it was the Auditorium Arena in Denver, and uh, it was the Rolling Fucking Stones. What can I say, you know? They were singing through the, it was an in and around kind of place where they would have boxing matches and stuff, and, or they would have, you know, probably all kinds of stuff that they did there, you know, over the years. And uh, it was next door to the Auditorium Theater, which was a, where, you know, they'd have Frank Sinatra or people like that with orchestras and stuff, you know, that kind of stuff, and plays and all, all kinds of stuff at the Auditorium Theater. But anyways, same, same building downtown. They sang to the announcers, speakers in the ceiling. You know, there was no PA system in those days in 1966, you know, 65. That just didn't happen, you know. So there were two mics on stage, one for Mick Jagger and one for whoever else was going to walk up and sing harmony. And they made it about 25 minutes, and there was mayhem. The girls, these young girls are trying to, the cops are trying to keep them off the stage, and the girls are, you know, trying to get past the cops, and finally the cops just shut the show down. And, and they had to ki- get the stones through the crowd to get them, because it's in the round. There was no way to get off stage except for to walk through the crowd, you know. And so they had to have a, you know, form a, you know, like a wedge to get them through, you know. And, and it was pretty kind of exciting, you know, to see the Rolling Stones. Could you even hear Charlie? Yeah. Because it doesn't seem like Charlie would be the kind of drummer that would project. Well, you know, it's weird. You know, back in those days, I also saw the Love and Spoonful at the Denver Coliseum. They had, they really pulled out all the stops. They had two electric voice banana column speakers on stands on each side of the stage instead of one. That's what the promoter provided, you know, <laughs> and a couple of mics to sing through. Once again, you know, there was no mics in the drums, or except for the, the drummer had a, was a singer, so he had a mic. And um, Zal had a mic, and John Sebastian had a mic. So there's three mics on stage, basically. But you could hear fine, you know. It was the love and spoonful. They were great. So I don't know. People just did that back then, you know. You think about Elvis Presley playing shows with, in 1957 or 58. There was no mic on his guitar. Back of a flatbed truck. Yeah, or anywhere. There was never a mic on Elvis's guitar, but you can kind of hear it, you know, if you hear some of those live recordings, you know. And Bill Black had a, a sure mic stuck into, like, wrapped, like, a, it was just taped to the bass on, down there by the bridge, you know, by the tailpiece. And sometimes he plugged that into a Fender amp if there was a, one available, you know. I think I've seen pictures of him plugged into a tweed fender. But a lot of the times it was just, before they had a DJ, it was just Bill on upright bass, Elvis on acoustic guitar, and Scotty with a, his little amp on a chair. And so he's really probably all, the only thing he really heard, you know, that in the vocal. It was, and the same thing with Johnny Cash recordings from the you know, late 50s, early 60s. All you hear is Luther and Johnny's voice. All you hear is drum, tick, 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 and Johnny, you know. Yeah. I really liked the early stuff a lot, you know, because those were some of the first time you heard those songs, you know, like Helen Wolf tunes and Muddy Waters tunes and that kind of stuff. I mean, Jimmy Reed. I heard, we had Jimmy Reed records because he was. They played him on the radio when I was really little. I liked that era, but then I saw him on their first night of the 69 tour, and that would have been Mick Taylor's second gig. He played Hyde Park with him in London, and then they went to L.A. and rehearsed, and then they started their tour in Fort Collins, Colorado. That was the first night of that tour. So that would have been Mick's second gig in the, with the Stones live. And man, B.B. King opened the show, and this is pre-Thrill is Gone B.B. King, when he was still thin and playing his ass off. Playing, you know, he's a, he, he could play jazz, you know. People don't know that, but he could. And he had a, you know, 16-piece band. They, I think they, at that time, they were doing roughly 350 dates a year, you know, 
which is insane. And they, you know, they're all dressed up, you know, matching suits, you know, they're all wearing suits and ties, you know, and baby comes out and just murdered it. I mean, it was like they were so punchy and tight and he was singing his ass off and playing, you know, it's fierce, you know, he's on fire in those days. And the band was just, t how could it be any tighter than that band? You know, if you're playing 350 shows a year, you're going to be tight. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how are these Rolling Stones going to follow this guy, you know? Because they, he didn't leave anything, man. He wore that place out. And um, they come on stage, you know, and, this, you know, back in those days, there was no real production. You know, there was just a backdrop, a white backdrop maybe, and if there was even that. And, you know, spotlights, just maybe two. And that was it. But it's the Rolling Stones. And there was a, Stu had his grand piano set up behind Keith's amp, kind of pointing at Charlie. He would play on some songs. He had a tuxedo with tails. And he'd sit down and play, you know. <laughs> and a lot of times he wouldn't play. He was the, the roadie, and he set everything up, you know. They flew into Stapleton Airport in Denver. He flew in early with the gear, loaded it into a truck, took it up there, set it up, and then they flew in and rented some cars and drove up. And then when the show was over, they drove back to the airport and flew back to L.A. that night. You know, it wasn't like it is now, you know. And um, But they walk out on stage and... Keith and uh, Charlie started the first song off. And Bill's just standing there, you know, holding his bass. And man, when he hit the bass, they were playing through those SVTs. They all had those big Ampeg amps, you know. When he, when he came in and the Rolling Stones sound, you know, it, first Keith and, and Charlie, and then he comes in and I was like, whoa. You know, it was like, wow. You know, this is it, man. And um, when they got to the Midnight Rambler, all bets were off. It was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. That audience was going crazy. And Mick was just, you know, whipped him into a frenzy on that one. That was kind of the centerpiece of the show, really. That was the one. Are those Ampegs or the V4s? Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. sound good, man. Yeah, man, I had one, but I got rid of it because where am I going to use it, you know? I had one years ago mm -hmm. and used it a little bit. And so good. Loud as hell. but Yeah, good tone, though. Yeah. Man, they sounded great, no matter what they played. I mean, it didn't matter what amps those guys used. They always sounded good. Yeah, have, you heard, have you heard the one about brown sugar? Uh, the, the Stanley Booth, is that his name, the Southern writer? Mm -hmm. um, he wrote that song. Uh, that uh, He wrote the book, uh, was it Dancing with the Devil? Uh, he was on that tour uh, th that I saw. He was he was at the rehearsals in L.A. and he went on the tour with them most of the time. Not all the dates, but he was on a good. He traveled on the plane sometimes with them, hung out in the hotels and stuff. And he wrote a book about it about ten years after that happened, and uh, a really good book. It's called Dance with the Devil or something like that. Great, but he was at the recording session in Muscle Shoals where they cut the basic for Brown Sugar. And he said it was late at night and they're trying to get this song together. He said it sounded like shit. He said it just, it didn't, he said it sounded terrible. And he said they take after take and they're eh, talking and you know, messing around. And he said they finally did this one take and Charlie stood up and said, there it is, that's the track. And he, and he put a stick stand and left. And he was like, that's it? Alan's like, well, I guess I won't, you know, that doesn't sound very good. And he said that he left the tour, and the next time he saw him, he, I, I think it was New York City in, in the hotel room, and they've got a tape recorder there, and they're dancing to Brown Sugar, and it has the overdubs on it. They did the overdub somewhere else. And he said, this is the greatest song I've ever heard. <laughs> it's like, that was the take I heard, but it didn't sound like that when I heard it, you know. And when they got all the other information on there, he said, you know, he said he couldn't believe it, you know. Jim Dickinson said that in his book, that uh, yeah. in those sessions. That he they, was there, yeah. That they were terrible, and then all of a sudden they'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
you know, most of my favorite bands really aren't good musicians, you know, in, in reality, you know, in the real world, you know. I mean, my favorite band is Fontaine's DC, and they're, they're definitely not great musicians, but they're my favorite band, you know. I'd, I'd give anything to see Fontaine's DC. They played Nashville, and I was out of town. <laughs> 